Yes, let's let them in. Let's get started. Welcome, everyone. Very good to see you today. Three, two, one, zero. Ignition. The vehicle is lifted. Lift off time is 1-59-01-00 Zulu. RC transition operation procedures to PRC LP-1435. IT units PRC LP-1457 reported anomalies. Please confirm I have no fires on the pad. I have no visual. Please confirm no fires on the pad. Moving to ground. Avionics. Responding AVI. Plus 130. Our speaker for today, Joseph Marlin, who is the Deputy Chief Engineer of the Blue Ghost Lunar Program at Firefly Aerospace. I'm really excited to introduce our speaker for today, Joseph Marlin, who is the Deputy Chief Engineer of the Blue Ghost Lunar Program at Firefly Aerospace. Joseph was excited about space from a pretty young age. So we grew up in rural Pennsylvania and there was a huge cornfield behind our house. And whenever there wasn't corn growing there, Joseph would go out there and, and launch small rockets. And me and my other three sisters would rush out and watch from a safe distance. It was always really exciting, and we all knew that he was going to do amazing things one day. So he studied math and computer science in university and spent some seven years actually working with electrical grid substations before realizing in the middle of the pandemic that he wanted to pursue a career in space. So he packed up and he moved out to California. He was helping to build the first launch pad for Firefly Aerospace, which was sending rockets into space. Here is him with his launch pad and the rocket. After the launch pad was completed, he moved to start working on the avionics subsystem for the first Blue Ghost lander. I and mean, he was recently promoted to deputy chief engineer of the entire Blue Ghost lunar program, where he's able to work with interfacing different teams, helping all the different components come together for this lunar program. So I'm really excited to have him here because it's really important as scientists that we realize how important the engineers are and that we understand that space is so closely a linkage of science and engineering. So I'm really excited to hear from Joseph and hear about how missions use uh, engineering to work and make the science become a reality. So thank you, Joseph, for giving us your time. We're all really excited to have you here. Thanks, Tess. Yes, uh, many fond memories uh, blasting rockets off from the cornfield growing up. All right, as Tess said, I'm the Deputy Chief Engineer over at Firefly Aerospace. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the company before I get into a little more of the science focus. And we'll talk a little bit about what you as a biology payload might expect if you were tagging along for a mission. As Tess said, space is really this confluence of science and engineering, and both sides often need to work together in an environment that's extremely demanding and with a, a great number of constraints. That means that oftentimes, in order to meet one side's goals or objectives, you need to fully understand what the process looks like. So that's what I hope to give you guys a little bit today. Firefly is a rocket company at its core, but we have since expanded to being more of a end-to-end -end space transportation company. Firefly expects to, or, or Firefly aims to make sure that we can carry a payload from the Earth to its final destination, wherever that destination may be. So if that requires going to Mars to do science on Mars, then we can do that all the way from Earth to Mars. If that requires going to uh, one of the moons of Jupiter, we can do that too. So 
Founded in 2017, Firefly aims to make space for everyone. And that's just a, a phrase that implies that we're trying to bring down the cost to entry by making smaller rockets and more flexible trajectories. We have employees across several states, but our headquarters is in Texas in the United States of America at what we fondly call our rocket ranch. We have uh, several vehicle platforms. We have the launch platform, which you saw in the beginning, that's our rocket. We also have a lander and that's what I work on, our lunar lander program. And then we have the Elytra. The Elytra is an in-space mobility platform, which basically means if we, if with a rocket, take you to low Earth orbit, but you need to go somewhere else in our solar system and beyond, that little Elytra will take you where you need to go. And so in that sense, it's sort of a, a, a third stage to the rocket. Well, let's talk a little bit more about what we have where. As I said, we're based in Texas at the rocket branch. There's a picture of the rocket on one of our test stands. We also have our control center in our uh, Texas-based headquarters building. Tess mentioned that I drove out in the middle of the pandemic to work on a launch site in California. That's at Vandenberg Space Force Base. That's the United States West Coast Launch Complex. And then we're also building a launch pad in uh, Florida at Cape Canaveral. That's one of the most famous launch sites. That is where the Apollo missions launched from. And so uh, we have one of their launch pads there and we'll be launching from there in the next few years. A little bit of a look forward in what the company's planning on doing. We're currently flying the Alpha launch vehicle. That's the smallest vehicle here on the slide. But we're getting bigger and bigger until eventually in 2026, we aim to be launching the MLV, that stands for Medium Launch Vehicle, and that's in partnership with Northrop Grumman. As far as those Elytra product line uh, in-space mobility vehicles, you can see they get larger as we add more capabilities to take you as a payload farther and farther. And then we have two missions already lined up for Blue Ghost, and we're bidding on more. And so we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, lunar landers in just a minute. Where are we looking to go in the future? Well, we have a whole bunch of big plans and a lot of it relates to expanding our in-space capabilities. So you can see each of the various vehicles fills its own role in getting us to where we wanna go. So the rockets get us off the earth into low earth orbit. And then Elytra kind of takes over and Elytra takes those payloads to the moon or to Mars or other interplanetary transports. After uh, we get to those destinations, we have our landers, which get things down to the surface. So I said we'd talk a little bit more about the lunar program because that's what I do here at Firefly. And so let's talk about that. Uh, we work with NASA very closely as part of their commercial lunar payload services. That's CLIPS uh, program. In this program, NASA buys lunar lander services from commercial companies. It's a little different than the normal way that NASA works where they buy an entire mission. In this case, they are merely buying a ride and uh, we are encouraged to have other payloads on board while we go down. So CLIPS so far to date has launched nine, uh, has awarded nine missions to various US companies. None of them have launched yet, but the first one is likely to launch this year. And Firefly has received awards number six and number nine. So the most recent one is, uh, is our newest mission. Right now, CLIPS is solely focused on Earth's moon. And here's a little map of where the various CLIPS awards are going. Since this mission, uh, since this graphic was made by NASA, there has been a few updates. First of all, CP21 was awarded and also CS3 was awarded. The CS3 mission is our second mission and that's going to the far side of the moon. As you may know, the moon is tidally locked with Earth. So we only ever see one side of it. And as a result, landing on the far side is a little more challenging. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The other Firefly mission is Blue Ghost uh, Mission 1 here, which is landing in Mare Crisium. That's the Sea of Crises, 
a somewhat foreboding name for a mission, but it's an exciting geological area. And you can actually see it with the naked eye. If you look up at the moon, you look at the top right section, you can see a small dark circle. That's a, a mare or a, or a sea. And that's where our first lunar mission will be going next year. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about that mission one. There's a nice rendering of it landing and a little illustration of where it will be going. This was the 19D task order from CLIPS from NASA. We're expecting it to last about one lunar day. That's about 14 Earth days. And then a few hours actually into lunar night. Lunar night is a very challenging environment to survive in because first of all, there's no sunlight. So we can't generate power. We have to run off only our batteries. And more importantly, it gets extremely cold in lunar night. And so that means we have to power on all our heaters in order to protect ourselves from the extreme cold. On board the Blue Ghost Mission 1 lunar lander is 10 NASA-sponsored payloads. The bulk of those payloads actually investigate the various qualities of the moon dust. Moon dust is called the regolith, and it has a number of very problematic properties. Specifically, it's extremely sharp, but there's no wind on the moon. That means there's no erosion. And so these pieces of lunar dust get extremely sharp after being pounded by asteroids over the millennia. And it's also electrically charged, which means when astronauts walk in it, it sticks to their suits. These extremely sharp, fine particles get inside the suits and destroy bearings and mechanical interfaces, extremely bad to breathe. So overall, very problematic. And so a lot of this mission is going to be studying this regolith in ways to uh, mitigate those problems for the astronauts that will be walking on the moon as part of the Artemis, Artemis program. If you're not familiar with the Artemis program, I should add, it is the NASA mission to land the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. And the first Artemis mission was an uncrewed mission that has already launched. The next one should be coming up in the next year or two. I want to talk a little bit about the science that's being done on board Blue Ghost Mission 1, because that's why we're here to do science. There's 10 NASA payloads, like I mentioned. The first is the regolith adherence characterization. This payload has a series of various coatings on that disk you see on the left. And those coatings are different materials that are aiming to prevent dust from sticking to it. So basically, it tests all these different coatings and sees which one has the least dust sticking to it. Over to the right on the top row is scalps. This is the series of cameras that are mounted all over the lander, and they are going to study the way that the moon dust shoots up into space around the lunar lander. Lunar dust is very problematic for landers because it can block visibility and block instruments being able to see where the surface is. By better understanding the moon dust as we land, we'll be better able to ensure that we have safe landings for, for astronauts. Lunar Planet Vac is a tool that uses compressed air to shoot up regolith into a sampling chamber so they can do experiments on it. Electrostatic dust shield is, a, even if you recall, I mentioned that that regolith is electrically charged. This is an experiment to see if we can use high voltage to repel that lunar dust. The Lister drill is a pneumatic drill. That means it uses compressed air instead of mechanical drilling. That's going to plan on going down about two or three meters into the lunar surface and measure the various temperature gradients as it goes. Next gen retro, a uh, next gen lunar retro reflector and GLR is one of my favorites just from a, uh, uh, I can't believe they can do that perspective. This uh, retro reflector measures pulses, laser pulses from earth and they time how long those laser pulses take to get back to Earth, and they can figure out how far away the Earth is from the moon down to sub-millimeter range. Uh, Retroreflectors have been used on the moon since the days of Apollo, but this is a new one that will be used in conjunction with those Apollo-based or Apollo-era retroreflectors. All right. Moving on, Rad PC is a radiation tolerant computer. The space environment has a lot of radiation, and this can cause various electronics to have uh, problems. They can stop working, they can reset, they can uh, be permanently damaged. And so this is an experiment to see if we can make a computer that will be uh, tolerant to those effects, not necessarily immune, just it will be able to keep going despite them. 
Next, Lunar, I'm just going to call it LMS. This is a really interesting payload that shoots these four electrodes out in all four directions. And it does that to map the and characterize the moon's mantle by looking at those magnetic fields in all four of the cardinal directions. These uh, spheres you see here are actually the spheres that shoot out. Okay, uh, lastly, we have uh, El Alugre. This is a GPS receiver. It'll be the first time that we attempt to use uh, GPS from outside of the Earth, a very exciting experiment. That's actually a cooperation with, the, uh, with an Italian company in ESA. And then lastly, Lexi. Lexi. Lexi is a telescope, and it will be primarily used actually during the transit to, uh, to, to the moon instead of while we're on the surface. So the, we do expect some, some operations while we're on the surface. All right, that wraps up the science for Blue Ghost Mission 1. For Blue Ghost Mission 2, as I mentioned, we're going to the far side. That requires a little bit of extra logistics because the far side is tidally locked away from Earth. It means we can't talk to it with our radio receiving stations on Earth. That means that we have to send two spacecraft, one of which lands and the second of which orbits the Earth and talks to the lander on the far side. Basically what happens is you have the lander landed on the far side and the relay, it's called a relay, a data relay, orbits around the moon. And when it's on the side with the lander, it talks to the lander, saves all that information, goes around to the earth side and relays all that to the earth. Then it gets any updates from earth and goes around again and passes those messages on to the lander. This mission is expected to go in two or three years and it will be carrying unlike the first mission really only one major payload and that is lucy knight lucy knight stands for lunar surface electromagnetics experiment in night and this is a payload that's really looking to explore the very beginnings of the universe this studies the cosmic dark ages, about 30,000 years after the Big Bang. And it's a partnership between a bunch of various uh, agencies, including the United States Department of Energy, uh, UC Berkeley, and also NASA's Science Mission Directorate. This is a radio telescope, and that's what those four long antenna are. And it uses the Earth, uh, sorry, excuse me, it uses the moon as a uh, basically a shield because it's listening to radio waves from the very beginning of time it needs an extremely quiet radio environment and so by being on the far side of the moon we can use the mass of the moon to block all of the noisy radio waves from earth and uh, we, we can take advantage of that very quiet radio radio silence on the far side of the moon if you notice night at the end of the uh, payload's name, that's because it does plan to mostly operate during night. And that's to, in order to keep the radio noise from the sun out of the uh, measurements as well. All right, let's talk a little bit now about how if you were a payload, you would get to your destination. There's a few different places you can put payloads on uh, our landers, basically. Uh, you could go on the lander itself, or you could go on the, the relay, the transfer vehicle. One of the most important things when you're working on landers, or even anything in space, is mass. Mass is extremely expensive to get into space because you have to fight gravity the entire way while you're on the rocket. As a result, most of the time you'll see payloads specified in terms of mass, so we can get 150 kilograms to the surface or much more into orbit around the moon. If you're wondering why it's so much more around the moon than it is to the surface of the moon, again, it comes down to those gravity losses. As you're landing on the moon, you have to slow your, your vehicle down quite a bit. You're moving very fast while you're in orbit, and so you have to slow your vehicle down all the way to barely moving and the entire time you're doing that, you're fighting gravity. Planetary protection is a very important thing if you are sending science to a, another 
or uh, another planetary body. NASA has planetary protection provisions for various uh, destinations, and they categorize them differently depending on what the destination is. For example, the moon is in general not a great place to look for uh, signs of life. This is because the moon has no atmosphere and most of the requirements for what life needs as we understand life do not exist on Earth's moon. And so they're not particularly worried about us contaminating the moon. However, they do have a baseline number of requirements and to that end firefly does operate a clean room where we try to keep all of our spacecraft electronics and structures as clean as possible the goal here is to make sure that we as uh, humanity does not accidentally contaminate uh, any of the other bodies in our solar system with life and then find that life and say hey look at that there's life on jupiter uh, so basically, we need to keep our uh, spacecraft as clean as possible. There are a few areas on the moon where we are actually concerned with planetary protection. These include permanently shadowed regions, which are areas that have not seen sunlight for millions of years. And as a result, they have a lot of uh, volatiles in the compounds in the, in the lunar surface. This means that they have a lot of value to understand the history of the moon and the history of the solar system. And they also often contain large amounts of liquid water ice. As a result, it's important to keep those areas clean so we can do good science there. And then they also, NASA also mentions that they wanna keep the Apollo landing sites clean, both because of the interesting heritage of those sites and because of the scientific value of those sites. So to that end, uh, Firefly does, like I mentioned, operate a clean room, but it's important to note that if you are doing a uh, mission to anywhere else besides Earth Moon, you're likely gonna have, uh, you're gonna work with a space company that's gonna do a lot more effort into keeping everything clean and pristine in order to make sure that the science results you get back from your astrobiology experiment are relevant and reliable. All right. Next, I want to talk about what it looks like to send a payload to a, uh, to a destination. Let's say you have an astrobiology experiment that you want to send to Mars, and you want to do some checks for life to see if you can find certain compounds that might have uh, you know, in the past been associated with uh, organic life forms. And so the first thing you would do is design, a, a design your, your payload and come up with ICDs. Now in this sense, a payload is simply a device that you want to send to the surface. It can be uh, a, a, maybe a, a sampling drill and then some maybe a mass spectrometer that you wanna look at the, the results of your sample, or it can be something as, uh, as simple as maybe a mirror, like the retroreflector. Regardless of what it is, it needs to have a design and then it needs to have an ICD. The ICD stands for interconnect diagram or definition. And it is basically, uh, I have an example of the Apollo ICD. It kind of explains to the user what the expected uh, interface between the payload, that's you, and the spacecraft, that's us. After you go back and forth and you design this payload in cooperation with the uh, the spacecraft manufacturer, and you, you make sure that all of your needs are, are being met from the science perspective and that uh, you aren't asking for more power than they can give you and you're not taking more mass than they can take, you go ahead and you do fit checks and mass models. Fit checks and mass models are important because they are the first time that you actually make sure that your payload will fit on top of the spacecraft. So here you can see a picture of the Blue Ghost Lunar Lander mass model. This is a representative model of the lander and it's mounted on a vi vibration isolator so that we can transport it safely. We take this mass model to large vibration tables and we shake it to uh, emulate what will happen during a uh, launch vehicle ascent. And we make sure that all the payloads are gonna be safe for that very rough ride to space. 
Also, around the time that you'll be doing fit checks and mass models, you'll also probably get something like a payload integration test kit. This is the ability for you to test your data interfaces. Most payloads have an onboard computer that controls the payload and maybe does a little bit of preliminary science before you even get those results to Earth. In this sense, it's important to make sure that your payload computer can talk well to the spacecraft computer and the spacecraft radios. And so what you see on the right is a picture of a generic flat sat. This is not our flat sat, but it's what flat sats look like. It's called a flat sat because it's basically all the electronics of the satellite laid out on a table on a flat surface. And this allows you to test all of the electrical interfaces before you're even building your lander. The payloads would come here or they would uh, receive a, a, a model of the spacecraft computer and they would go ahead and test and make sure that all of, all of the payloads computers and all the payloads protocols can communicate properly with the onboard computer. When you are sure that your payload is speaking well with the computer, and it fits on the spacecraft, and you're getting the right amount of power and data, and you have the right ma mass, you go ahead and deliver it. And here's a, a picture from one of our payload deliveries. This is Lunar Planet VAC delivering their spacecraft to us here at Firefly. In the middle is our mission manager, and then on the two, uh, on either side of her is two of the lead engineers from the Lunar Planet VAC team. At delivery, we do a number of tests to make sure that everything is working as it should be before they uh, leave. And uh, that way, if there are any problems, the, the experts that build the payload can, can fix it. Also in this image is the PI, that stands for Principal Investigator. And so these, these folks are basically what you would be, the, the, the person in charge of all the science on the, the payload. And so even though they might not be the technical authority on, what, on how the payload actually works, they're there to make sure that the science objectives are going to be met. After the delivery is complete, we do a safe to mate. This is where we check all the interfaces and make sure that if we power it on, everything is going to be powered on correctly and we won't accidentally damage the payload. And from that point on, it's time to start actually building it into the spacecraft. Here's one of our lead avionics, uh, excuse me, one of our lead AI and T engineers. That's an uh, assembly integration and test engineers and one of our technicians. And they are both uh, working to integrate various cable harnesses onto the spacecraft in preparation for adding the actual payload to the spacecraft. So that's the actual lunar lander there that they're working on. Okay. After the payload is successfully mated to the spacecraft, we'll do checkouts where we actually run the flight computers talking to the uh, avionics on board the spacecraft, which are then talking to the payload. And we make sure that end-to-end -end, uh, ex end -end communication pathway works. This is obviously not a picture of the payload on the spacecraft yet, because uh, that hasn't happened yet, but it'll be happening in just a few weeks. And uh, we'll be doing that exact training that I'm describing. When the spacecraft is fully built, we take the entire spacecraft to large chambers. This is an example of an anechoic ch test chamber. This is a test to look at the various electromagnetic interferences and make sure that none of the payloads will be hurt by the spacecraft's radios and vice versa. We also take this spacecraft to very large thermal chambers where we can make sure that they will work uh, amongst hot temperatures and cold temperatures. And we take it to very large vibration tables where we shake the entire spacecraft at a uh, same profile as the launch vehicle to make sure it will survive that. The next part's the part that everyone's familiar with. That's when we shoot the payloads and the spacecraft into space. And from there, we move on to launch uh, into LEOP, which stands for basically launch and early operations. 
This is the commissioning phase of the spacecraft where we power everything on for the very first time while it's in space. And we work to make sure that all the payloads are working correctly. So the various instruments are turned on and they're tested and make sure that they're still working after the long launch to space. And the PIs will check to make sure that all the data they're getting from their instruments looks like it's in expected bounds so that we can make sure that if we need to calibrate anything, we do that and make sure that we're not getting any unexpected impacts from the space environment. I've mentioned now a few times that the space environment is really pretty traumatic for most spacecraft. The uh, has huge ranges of uh, temperature as we go out from behind the Earth's shadow and, and then back into the sun as we orbit the Earth. It has quite a bit of radiation in the Earth's radiation belts, the Van Allen belts. You have very severe vibrations during launch and during landing. You have atomic oxygen, which can erode surfaces. And you have a, a great deal of uh, just, just logistical concerns as you try to, to move between various comm stations on the earth. We have various radar dishes, uh, excuse me, satellite receivers scattered throughout the earth's surface. But over the ocean, for example, you're unlikely to get a good link. And so you have to make sure that the satellite can uh, control itself while you're in between ground stations. Lastly, this is now you've completed your long wait to get your actual science results back from the spacecraft. The operations period begins with a LEOP, but it ends whenever you arrive at your destination. You actually turn on your instruments to start performing your science. Most payloads will have worked out beforehand when they want to operate, but some of them will need to make decisions based on the science that they're getting back on what they want to do next. And so the science teams work very closely with the operators to define what decisions you want to make each day and what operations you want to perform. For example, on the, on the surface of Mars, the uh, next day's operations are planned by the ops team the day before when they plan where each rover is going to go and when each of the instruments is going to be active. That's going to work the same way for us on the moon. We'll, each day we'll plan on which operations will be uh, performed and we also want to make sure that none of the other payloads are going to interfere with each other. For example, if you have a payload that wants to see how well dust uh, can be rejected, you don't want to operate that at the same time as the drill because the drill kicks up a lot of dust. This overall is referred to as CONOPS, that's the concept of operations, and it's the plan that you have in order to define what operations you're going to do when. Okay, I now want to do a quick plug for any of you who are interested in sending science into orbit. Firefly is offering free uh, launch for CubeSats. So if you know of a CubeSat team or work on a CubeSat team and you want to do some science, you can get a free ride to space. And uh, you can find out more there at fireflyspace.com slash dream. Because this is free and it's aimed at education, uh, it does need to be an educational institution looking to help train that next generation of rocket scientists and, uh, and, and science. That's all I had for my presentation. Uh, I hope you guys learned a little bit more about the uh, process by which you as a scientist would get your payload to, to space and to orbit or to wherever your final destination may be. I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you, that was great. So anyone who has questions, you can now ask in the live questions channel on Discord. Um, I would like to start with my own question. How do you guys select which science payloads get to go on each uh, mission? For CLIPS programs, that's actually selected by the NASA CLIPS office. NASA CLIPS will, uh, review hundreds of proposals for various science that they want to send to the moon and it will select some based on a number of um, criteria including value to the decadal surveys and to the artemis program 
as well as simply what the mass of the, of the payload is and, and how much it prevents uh, other payloads from coming along. Cool. Um, so let's see, Agatha from the UK is asking if the moon environment sees more radiation than typical space missions, and if the regolith and moon environment cause any interaction with communications and radio waves. Okay, so for the first question, does the moon see more radiation activity than the uh, typical space mission? So I'll define typical space mission as something in Earth orbit. And the answer is that's a little complicated, but basically the, uh, the, a, a large amount of the radiation that you experience in space is the radiation is trapped particles in the Van Allen belts. These are often trapped protons and trapped electrons in the Van Allen belts. And there's also the South Atlantic anomaly. This is the bulk of the total ionizing dose that a spacecraft will experience. And so in that sense, going to the moon is actually less radiation than a payload that stays in Earth orbit for its lifetime. However, because you do have that protective magnetic field that traps those particles there in the first place, the Earth actually suffers less from a phenomenon called GCRs, galactic cosmic rays. And these are uh, either uh, spit out from the sun or they're just coming from other places in the uh, universe. And because of that, uh, the, the moon's exposure to galactic cosmic rays is actually a little more severe than it is on Earth. So uh, it can be a little bit of both. Um, it is worth noting that a lunar lander has a much, much, much shorter period of, of operation than a typical Earth orbiting satellite. And so in general, from a total dose perspective, you have much less uh, concern for a lunar lander than you would for a, an orbit, uh, an orbiter around Earth. And the second question was, uh, do, does the moon's uh, dust have any impact on uh, radio waves? And the answer is not so far as we know. Um, that said, there have been uh, precious few lunar landers. And so uh, that'll probably be something we'll be continuing to watch for. Thank you. Um, so then Muhammad asks, what can we expect to be different on the dark side of the moon and will it have different geology or mineralogy compared to the brighter side? Interesting. Well, definitely the far side of the moon has many more craters and that's as a result of not having that protective shield from the earth, which can burn up some incoming craters. That's why you see a lot of those maris, the, the big dark areas of, of magma, of cooled magma on the Earth's side. And then on, if you look at pictures of the far side, it's, it's very cratered. And so from that perspective, we can expect to see a lot more extra lunar geology on the far side, just by merit of having more craters. So another question about sustainability, Agatha was wondering, is there any goals of looking into sustainable rocket fuels and your overall goals of improving space accessibility? Yeah, so that's one of the, the, the most exciting things about permanently shadowed regions is they do have large amounts of frozen water ice. And so you can, you can turn water into hydrogen and use that as a fuel. And from that perspective, the moon could be a great way station, a refueling station for, for future missions. Cool. Um, and then there's a few questions on the three cubes at launch. Do you mind going back a slide to just show that URL again? Uh, yes. Okay, so here's the website. And I assume there's more information here that you guys could all get. Um, yes. So, yes, so on the website, there is an RFP which states all the requirements that you need to submit while applying for this. And uh, Firefly will review them and select those that have, uh, you know, the most ability to, to help educational institutions. Would a nonprofit like Womenium also qualify? Yeah, I think on our first dream mission, we flew something from Teachers in Space. Um, so, yeah, I think so. All right. Guys, Can we do a team set? <laughs> that's trying to make it happen. <laughs> exactly. Very cool. Okay, another question. Uh, so are there any plans to drill through ice caps and search for liquid water, asks Sudha. Uh, I don't think that there's any current evidence that there is large underground reservoirs of liquid water. However, the next CLIPS mission that's being bid does include a large drill called Prospect. And that drill is looking to drill into 
permanently shadowed regions, very small ones called micro PSRs, and study the volatiles in those regions. And I think based on the science returned from that mission, that could inform a decision to eventually send something to drill into it to an ice cap. What's the scale of a micro PSR? Like how small is it? It could be anywhere from a few meters to a few centimeters. Very cool. Thank you. Joshua from the Philippines asks, while Firefly's dedication to reducing the cost and enhancing the efficiency of space travel is exciting, it's integrating technologies to decrease the impact of upcoming missions on the expanding collection of space debris around Earth's orbit part of this vision. Yeah, that's a big concern for everyone, obviously. And that's one of the the reasons that we're building Elytra. Elytra is really good at moving things around in space. And what that means is it's also very good at bringing things back down to Earth. I think one of the biggest challenges facing us as far as orbital debris mitigation is sort of how to actually go that last mile. We're, we're, we're plenty good at getting stuff into space and moving around in space, but you got to get a hold of something. And it could be something that's out of control and tumbling. And there's the number one concern would be that if anything goes wrong with that, you can actually have a collision and make far more orbital debris than you had before. So uh, it's solving that last mile problem that a lot of companies are working on with really exciting ideas, which could have a lot of synergy with the Elytra vehicle to get those pieces of debris down, especially out of control, obsolete satellites. And would you work with like also taking debris from like other companies or even other countries or would it mostly be your own debris? No, the, the goal would get contracts from, you know, whichever company put it up there to bring it back down. Very cool. Abbas from, the, uh, from Pakistan asks, how will Elytra be fueled and will every mission need one? Elytra is going to be fueled in two different ways. The first Elytra we're sending up is fueled with just cold gas thrusters. And so this is basically you just have pressurized gas and you release it. And that pressure decreasing uh, accelerates the, the particles away from the spacecraft and therefore the spacecraft away from the particles. That said, future versions of Elytra, including the one that gets Blue Ghost Mission 2 to the moon, will have chemical thrusters. That means it, it uses uh, actual propulsion. And we use hypergolic propulsion. That means chemicals that when they touch each other spontaneously ignite. That's much easier to work with like than something with kerosene and, and liquid oxygen because that needs to be ignited before it, before it can provide a, an impulse. And what was the second half of that question? Will every mission need a new one? Uh, not every mission needs an Elytra. Elytras can stay in space and serve as multiple satellites and also some uh, for example, our first lunar lander is able to get to the moon all on all on its own. It doesn't need uh, an elytra to get it there. It, the second one needs an elytra because it's much larger that that large radio telescope on the surface. Also because it needs a uh, relay. Um, and then the orbiter for your second one will that be used for future landers as well, or will it just mostly be for yeah. that mission? Absolutely. That we're expecting to have at least a five-year lifespan on that orbiter. And so that will be able to serve as a relay for future lunar landers, for Artemis missions, or for our own projects. It actually has enough propellant to travel to Mars if we decide we want to go that way. Oh, very cool. I could be asking if the orbiter would come back to Earth or if it's just going to stay out there. No, the orbital for our second mission will just stay at the moon, orbiting the moon, in order to provide relay services to the various landers that will be following us. Cool. So then there's a question about the name of the company. So how did you guys come up with Firefly Aerospace? A uh, controversial question. The founder insists that it happened because one night on his porch in the, the fields of Texas, he looked up at the sky and marveled at all the fireflies and thought to himself that one day we'll have so many satellites and rockets in space that the night sky will look like that with, uh, with satellites. But I think it's because of the TV show. <laughs> Fair answer. So Sita is asking if you could elaborate on using hydrogen and oxygen on the moon as fuel and whether that's easy. Well, it's, it's nothing in space is easy. And that least of all, there's a lot that needs to be done before, before that would be practical. Not the first of which would be finding a large enough deposit of it and figuring out how to actually do the electrolysis on it to split it. But after that, you could use that, you could, you could make tanks to store it and use it to refill future missions. Very cool. So then there's a question on the cleaning process. Do you have any sense of, is there any way to monitor how clean they are once they get out there? Basically, like your landers, what like is to see, they? like, they're asking about the rockets, but I guess also like in the landers, can you monitor how much the buildup is on them? 
Yes. So for rockets, there's no cleanliness requirement because they don't go anywhere. They just fall back down to Earth and are reused or burn up in the atmosphere or fall into the ocean. The spacecraft, the general philosophy is it's easy to keep something clean than to get it clean after it's become dirty. And so we uh, go through a lot of processes to get things clean in the first place. This involves wiping it down with IPA, that's isopropyl alcohol, and putting things through thermal cycles at high temperatures in order to burn off any like oils from fingers or other materials. And then once it's in the clean room, nothing is touched without gloves and, and hair nets. There's various cleanliness levels from NASA's concept of visibly clean, which defines a certain number of particles visible from a certain distance without magnification, all the way down to, you know, you can actually send things away to be tested based on samples. Very cool. So another question, so at the end of the life of the orbiter, it will it crash onto the lunar surface or what will the, its end life look like? So sad. Mm -hmm. Silence. Uh, yes, it will crash onto the lunar surface or, or it will be disposed of in what's called a graveyard orbit, which is basically an orbit that's far out of the way of anything that could be affected by it. If it does crash into the lunar surface, obviously work would have to be performed ahead of time to make sure that it avoids any heritage sites. That's what they call the Apollo areas in order to make sure that we don't damage any of the, the NASA heritage sites. Are there heritage sites from any of the other companies that people are particularly caring about? Or sorry, any of the other countries? I suppose, well, definitely the Chinese have a rover. And I believe both Russia and China have also successfully landed. And so each of those would have areas where they also are concerned with, but uh, call it US centric or just realistic. None of those sites have had human landing. So they're perhaps somewhat less concerning. That said, we certainly don't want to be crashing into someone's operational rover. <laughs> That's fair. Could you give some advice on getting into base from a different career path? Yeah, good time to do so right now. There's been a lot of, at least in certain areas, it's tough to find people with the background needed. So so is it specifically from other career paths or, or from out of college? Maybe both coming from a not getting a direct degree in aerospace engineering. I would actually say many people do not have degrees in, in aerospace engineering. And one of the problems with aerospace engineering is it's a little too uh, generalized. And so often you can have better luck getting a degree in a specific engineering field, whether that be propulsion or a structural engineer or electrical engineer, mechanical engineer, than you might as just a generic aerospace engineer. As from coming from a different career, the key is just to talk about how your experiences in those other careers can benefit the company that you're applying to. A lot of people will come in with resumes talking about why they want the job, but at the end of the day, what the company wants to know is why you would help them. And so if you can show how your experiences in a different industry will help that space company, you're much more likely to get in. Very good advice. Sarah from Mexico is asking if you can elaborate on how you would study the origin of the universe from the dark side of the moon and what exactly is being looked for? Yeah, it's looking for the cause, it's looking into the cosmic dark ages. And so this is radio signals from the Big Bang at a very, very low wavelength. That's the reason for those long antennas. Not being on the, the science team for that mission itself, I don't know if I can intelligently speak more to it than that, but I encourage you to look into the Lucy Knight payload and if you're at all interested in that and, and kind of study what that science is looking to accomplish. Thank you. There's a question about the extraterrestrial end of life. Oh, so I think she's saying in general, when you are thinking about crashing things into the surface and stuff, like, is there a set of guidelines and rules that you have to follow when you're thinking about end of life for your missions? Not yet. Certainly for Earth orbit, there has been new regulations that say all spacecraft must be able to come down within five years. So that will help that orbital debris problem at Earth. But as for, uh, you know, extraterrestrial, no, there's no uh, there's no sense of guidelines right now. You know, Cassini burned up in Saturn's atmosphere. We will be crashing into the moon, one of the uh, elements of our mission, of our second mission and maybe even the, the, the payload. But it sounds kind of uh, harsh is the right word, but it sounds kind of irresponsible to just go like chucking stuff into the moon. But it's important to note that there's nothing on the moon right now except for numerous crashed payloads. And so the only thing that you really need to watch out for is areas that have already been explored. And so the goal is just to avoid all of those. Makes sense. There's a question about international authority for space missions. Is there an international set of regulations or anyone do basically anything with space in the moon if they have the money for it? 
Well, the most exciting update for moon exploration and international cooperation is the Artemis Accords. Quite a few com- countries have signed on to the Artemis Accords. I was actually just speaking to someone from the Brazilian Space Agency, and they just recently signed the Artemis Accords and are going to be working in that. And the Artemis Accords are basically a framework of agreements for what and how to operate on the moon. It includes details like you can't claim the moon, and it also includes operational details such as the framework provides a precedent for agreements such as LunaNet. LunaNet is an agreement of which frequencies can be used where on the moon. And uh, so, I don't know if you can see it, but I have here the LunaNet, uh, some of the LunaNet requirements. And so this basically just shows which frequencies can be used in which direction. And it defines everything from Earth to or lunar orbit and then from lunar orbit to lunar surface and, and vice versa. And so there's a lot of this growing uh, framework as the lunar surface becomes more populated and lunar orbit becomes more populated. Thankfully, starting to see a lot of really good cooperation led by, I think, the Artemis Accords and, and all the countries that have signed on to those. Very cool. All right. We're almost at time. So I think we'll wrap up there. I really would like to thank you on behalf of the whole team for giving us this amazing presentation and sharing an hour of your morning with us. This is really exciting. I feel like I learned a lot and I hope everyone else did as well. So thank you, Joseph. So I hope this uh, gave everyone a really nice overview of how missions are planned today and how you could start planning your mission as well. If you have questions, again, we are always here to help you and help you think through your mission. Uh, But this was a really great example, I think, of how to plan missions. What does the process look like? What do realistic timelines look like as well? And how do real engineers plan their missions and payloads? So very exciting. All right. Com check one, two. Hi, guys. Hi. Thank you for coming. It's actually nice to see a real office, though. Maybe you could talk about the boxes. That makes us human and and like where we are. (laughs) Yes. Very nice to to meet you and welcome, uh, Joseph. Wonderful to have you here. Uh, my name is Prachi Vakaria, one of the co-founders of Women in Foundation. We started in 2017 with the goal to advance people, especially women people, but really all people in the cutting edge of sciences and technology. And for this, we typically work with U.S. federal agencies. So one of our first programs was with an agency called ARPA-E, uh, which you may be familiar with. It's modeled after DARPA, which is under Department of Energy, where we train students in cutting edge energy applications, took them to ARPA-E and afterwards uh, to the ARPA-E annual summit. And after that, I uh, had many of them work on ARPA-E funded projects at places like Park Palo Alto Research Center, SRI, and others. From there, we expanded. So we, we started working then with NASA on the James Webb Space Telescope. Again, actually, we trained and facilitated students working on the testing of the James Webb at Goddard when it was here. We worked with NIH on computational neuroscience. And this year, we have two flagship programs. One is on quantum computing, and this is in partnership with a scientist at NIST, where we train students on the cutting edge in quantum computing, sensing, communications. And it's a very intensive one-month program, now one of the largest quantum programs in the world. And then the second one is this one, which we are happy you're a part of, uh, which is focused on biology. And, you know, everybody studies biology and they think of, like, this is a cell, what a cell looks like, and this is the mitochondria. But that's a bit boring, I think. People don't study the cutting edge of biology, the kind of cool things in biology. And this is where we've created this program to get people excited on what's, what's at that frontier in biology, things like astrobiology and soon we'll have programs in aging biology and climate biology geobiology and other domains and in this program you're joined by uh, Tess of course who's our organizer she's a scientific head and leader for for this program and uh, lots of other amazing speakers so Dr. Morgan Cable came and spoke she did our keynote Kelly Case from NASA as well and we're super excited to have you here thank you and thanks for the the rundown of the organization it sounds really incredible yes we've trained over thousands of people and our goal with every program is at least tilt it so that there's more women than men than the industry average at the moment well it's not hard <laughs> Cool. Wow. What a slide. That look okay. Is this from your, your launch in September? Yes. That was wow. our night launch. That's a beautiful picture. They'll all want you to hire okay. them for sure. Perfect. Hey, we're hiring. Do you Great. take uh, non-US citizens or no? They need to be a US person. They do not need to be a US citizen. They need a green card or something. Yeah. There's a few parts of the legal definition for a U.S. person, but because of the ITAR, International Trade and Arms Regulation, U.S. persons. Fair. Yeah, I think uh, any permanent legal resident is, is considered a U.S. citizen, regardless of how, like green card or permanent visa. Gotcha, gotcha. 
Absolutely. If you'd like, Teresa, you can send out my email and anyone with questions can shoot them over to me if I didn't get to them or if they have any other questions. And yeah, on behalf of everyone here at Firefly, thanks so much for everything that you guys are doing to promote science, explore the universe around us. Thanks, Tess, and thanks, Prachi, and thanks everyone else for having me. Thank yeah. you, Joseph. Thank you for inspiring us. Of course. Um, thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, everyone, if you want to stay on the line, we'll have a few flash talks after this, but uh, we can say thank you and goodbye to Joseph. All right. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. T minus five, four, three, two, one. S1 engine ignition, MLO is high. Lift off of Alpha Flight 2 on its mission to the Black. Plus counter started. Eco. Confirm stage two ignition and shut Let's down. Go. Look at that view. <laughs> <laughs> On C1, orbit achieved, Alpha is in the black.